Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, University of Ottawa, Laboratory for Paleoclimatology. If you're a chemtrailer believer and you think geoengineering is occurring, you might want to take a seat for this presentation. Basically, chemtrails don't exist. What you're seeing is contrails. The chemistry of the atmosphere has changed. The physical properties of the lower and upper atmosphere have changed. So the vapor that comes out of commercial aircraft, jet engines, behaves quite differently. These, these contrails consist of much smaller particles because the jet fuels are cleaner and those particles act as cloud condensation nuclei, nuclei. So the clouds that you're seeing are smaller, consist of smaller water droplets. So they're very, very bright. Because the stratosphere is colder, more of them are generated by just about, by, by, by a much, much larger numbers of these aircraft. And they persist for longer because they're much smaller. So therefore they can spread over much wider areas. So Climate change has changed the chemistry of the atmosphere, the physical properties of the lower and upper atmosphere differently. And this is causing very, very different behavior in the contrails. And I will explain some of the atmospheric chemistry as to why this is happening um, it following here. So basically, this is a temperature plot with altitude kilometers up here. So at the surface, say 15 degrees Celsius, you know, it drops off. Solar radiation comes in and heats up the Earth. The Earth then emits its own radiation, long ra radiation. The greenhouse gases are located in this region, so they trap most of that energy and heat up. Less long wave radiation is getting up to the stratosphere. So the stratosphere is cooling. So this is because the surface of the Earth is the hottest, the temperature as you go away from the surface decreases and there's ozone in the stratosphere. So that's absorbed by shortwave radiation. So the temperature increases as you go up. And also, so, so basically this is, this is what happens in the atmosphere. So the troposphere is warming because the greenhouse gases are located in the troposphere. The stratosphere, because it's getting less long wave radiation, is cooling. And I'll explain how that is leading to different behaviors of contrails, which is the, the vapor coming out of jet engines. And it contains a lot of water vapor, but also many other gases. So this is a plot here of what temperature is doing. In the lower, lower troposphere, Okay, which is near the which is near the surface, just above the surface. This is the temperature change from 1980 to 2010. There was a lot. There wasn't a lot of surface cooling at that point. You can see the effect of of uh, El Nino here. Um, you can also see the effect of volcanoes. As you go up into the into the troposphere, higher up from the surface, the there's still warming but it's less than at the surface. And as you go up into the upper atmosphere, which is the lower stratosphere, on average about 11 kilometers high, but that varies from about 17 kilometers high at the equator to about seven kilometers high at the poles, what you see is you see a cooling trend in the lower stratosphere. What happened with the large volcanoes, El Chichen in Mexico and Pinatubo in the Philippines, is it put a lot of dust and ash and, and dark material into the stratosphere. And that absorbed energy, so that caused a large heating of the, of the uh, stratosphere in, in, the, in, that, uh, in those particular years. So the behavior, this is a, this is a very well-known sign of climate change. Okay, sunspot activity, which deniers say has effects that would warm all levels of the atmosphere equally. This is a strong signature of, of what we're doing. We've changed the chemistry of the, of the troposphere. 
This shows you the temperature, the global mean stratospheric temperature anomalies at different altitudes. So 15 to 20 kilometers up, we've lowered the temperature about a degree or so. If you go up higher, the temperature is lower even more. And if you go up to 35 to 45 kilometers, okay, you, you've got uh, the, the cooling is greater and also at 40 to 50 kilometers up high. So the stratosphere cools um, and it cools more as you go up higher. This is the anomaly. This shows you the trend in surface temperature in the lower troposphere from 1979 to 2013 degrees Celsius per decade. And the scale is here. So you, many of you have seen this type of plot, this type of map before. We're getting extremely warm, extremely large warming and temperature anomalies in the northern hemisphere. Uh, up in the Arctic region. I mean, look at it here over Greenland, uh, 0.5 degrees Celsius increase per decade up in this region. So there's, there's, uh, this is a, in the lower troposphere. Now let's have a look in the lower stratosphere. So this is above the jet streams. You know, aircraft, commercial aircraft fly 30,000, 40,000 feet. Um, they're up in you know 30,000 feet, so about 10,000 meters or so, slightly less. So they fly 10,000, 11,000, 12,000 meters, even even higher commercial jets. So they're flying mostly in the stratosphere, and they do that because the air is thinner and they're above most of the weather. The weather happens in the troposphere, the lower atmosphere. So this is the lower stratosphere temperature trend from 79 to 2013. What you can clearly see is there's been cooling across the globe in the stratosphere. Some regions have more cooling, um, and other regions, there's more here, more here, and other re regions have a bit less, but the tra overall, there's been cooling of the stratosphere, the upper atmosphere. This shows you, okay, so, so that's one thing. Now, another thing is water vapor. How much water vapor is there in the stratosphere? So this is a plot from 1980 to about 2015. This is over Boulder, Colorado, and at different altitudes. So what you can see is this is the these are the lower altitudes, 24 to 26, 26 to 28 kilometers, and then as you go higher up, there's less and less water vapor. This is parts per million per volume of water vapor. What you can see is a general trend upwards at this particular location in Boulder, Colorado. This is a plot of the trend. So it's 0 0.04 plus or minus 0 0.01 parts per million per year increase in the water vapor in the stratosphere over Colorado. This is a plot shown a different way. This is the trend percent per year at different altitudes. So, so uh, if you're 10 kilometers just, to, just um, near the tropopause, you get more, in, more increase in water vapor percent per year, and that decreases as you go up higher. Okay, so there's more water vapor up there, but this doesn't happen all over the planet. In fact, if you go near the equator, this is stratospheric water vapor from 93 to 2006. And the low levels are the blues, and the, there's more blues. There's a lot of water vapor in the El Nino in 98, 99, going up into the stratosphere. But subsequent years, there was less water vapor at lower latitudes. So the water does depend on where you are, whether it's increasing or decreasing in the stratosphere. There's also ozone, OK? Ozone chemistry is at the heart of atmospheric chemistry. Atmospheric chemistry is very complex. But generally, if there's ozone loss, then there's lower temperatures because the ozone does not absorb, the UV, it does not absorb, uh, there's not as much ozone, doesn't absorb as much UV, so the stratosphere is colder. Then there's polar stratospheric clouds if you reach below minus 70 degrees Celsius or so. 
and then that leads to more ozone loss. So that's a positive feedback effect. Um, this is ozone has been declining over over time over the Arctic, for example. Um, of course, the ozone hole is what everybody thinks of. So the ozone chemistry is also important. Okay, so what happens? Okay, this is some of the. This shows you where the tropopause is, which is above it's a stratosphere, below it's a troposphere. You get aircraft sulfur and soot created. They act as cloud condensation nuclei. Um, there's sedimentation. Gravity pulls it out of the atmosphere. Some of it goes back down into the uh, troposphere. Eventually, when it gets in the troposphere, it's rained out very quickly within a week. But when it's in the stratosphere, it stays there for quite a while. This is why large volcanoes can cool the planet if, they're, if they put material into the stratosphere. So this is the, uh, so this is the Arctic or, the, or Antarctica, 90 degrees. This is the equator, about 17 kilometers down to eight, seven or eight kilometers, actually. So it does vary depending on where you are. Okay, let's look at the number of aircraft now. Okay, global aircraft numbers. This is aircraft produced worldwide. Okay, there's 2,000, 3,000. We produced a lot back here. Then oil prices went up pretty high. Production went down. Um, passenger kilometers in 2012, it's actually over, over the years. Okay, increasing growth. Number of commercial airplanes delivered by Boeing. This is, uh, you know, increasing. These things, they're produced, they're flying. Revenue from aircraft production, etc. So I don't need to really go into a lot of details, but 2014, for example, this is more talking about accidents. There were 38 million flights, um, 12 fatal accidents. That's 3.3 billion journeys. You know, uh, it's still a lot safer to fly than it is to walk across the street. Okay, but there's more and more planes. And what are, where are these planes flying? Okay, um, this is the uh, troposphere here up to about 10, 11 kilometers. That's on average. The, the greenhouse gases are here trapping the infrared heat. The planes are flying above the troposphere. They're generally in the stratosphere, much less turbulence. Okay, so they're flying in that region where the temperature is actually lower and the water vapor can be higher or lower, slightly depending on where you are. Okay, this is just an expanded view. Um, the temperature of jet engine exhaust. Okay, greater circular nozzle above about 500 degrees Celsius. And then as you go away from the nozzle, it drops. There's lots of information here. You know, I'm just Google temperature of jet exhaust. You can Google fuels of jet exhaust, etc. The fuels are cleaner burning. There's less sulfur in them. They're more pure. One of, but the, one of the things that this does is it makes the particles the, that are non-combusted much, much smaller. And these particles come out, plus the water vapor comes out, and it's coming into a colder region because it's in the stratosphere. So the, the probability of making contrails is larger. The contrails consist of water vapor, which coagulates on, on the particles from the jet engine. And because the particles are much smaller, the reflectivity is much higher. The, the, con, the contrails are very, very bright. Uh, because the particles are much smaller, the water droplets are much smaller in the contrails, the persistence in the stratosphere is much longer than before. So because of climate change, changing the physical properties, these contrails are much brighter, they last a lot longer. Therefore, they can be carried by the winds a lot further. Therefore, they can be spread across the sky, crisscross the sky and be very visible. And this didn't happen to the same extent before. And this is why the public is very confused and a lot of people think that there's, there, there's chemicals being sprayed but it's not happening. It's just water vapor and it's behaving a lot differently and it's confused a lot of people. What else did we have here? I guess that's it. 
Okay, so so basically 